hi, this is Kendra from Pencil and Pigment, and today I'm going to be doing an intermediate fine liner pen and ink tutorial. Now, as with my other intermediate tutorial video and the ones coming up, moving forward, I want to put the disclaimer up again. So please don't skip this part as it will answer questions as to why I didn't cover certain formats and different art supplies. So to recap, my beginning fine liner pen and ink tutorial video covered pens and different sizes, and for the surface I covered paper, and that was further broken down into weight, style, texture, and sizes. Again, as I make these larger format videos, it becomes really easy to see why there are so many beginning videos. Um, because you just, you begin at the beginning, you start from zero knowledge and you just build up on that and it's so much easier. Intermediate is much harder because it's harder to define. This intermediate means so many different things to so many different people. So to you, it could be defined as like time spent creating makes you intermediate. Um, with this medium, you know, maybe it's like confidence in the subject matter or an understanding of basic beginning knowledge of the techniques and supplies. So, and it could just be one of those things. It could be all of those things that are intermediate to you. And because of this, this video will be considered intermediate as it is compared to my beginning video. So, as also with this, there will be a longer, more complex tutorial at the end compared to the beginning pen and ink video as well. And that one had a tutorial of a bunny. And because I can't control how you find my channel or this video, it could be out of sequence. I will link in the description box my tutorial playlist that includes that beginning video that explains the basics. Okay, the first supply I want to talk about is surfaces. And there may have been a term you might have heard before, and it's called colored substrate. Now this applies as much to paper as other surfaces, and colored substrates as it applies to paper, not aquariums, is a term used to describe colored paper for creating or printing on. And I consider this an intermediate supply because the knowledge of value range understanding darks versus lights versus the middle range that is covered by the paper, and a cursory knowledge of color theory depending on what color paper you are using to create and draw on. So readily available artist paper you may have seen in art shops is the Strathmore Tone Tan, Tone Gray, uh, there's a blue, uh, Hanna Mula makes a cappuccino book. They have a gray one. Um, I will throw up images of all the products I'm talking about to, because we're all visual. <laughs> That's why we're here, we're artists, so I'll throw up pictures. Um, this paper, again, is a mid-range uh, color value, and Canson makes a black, so in theory you could use um, inks that show up on that, white ink, the gel pen by Sakura that's white would look really, really nice on black paper. That would be considered a colored substrate. So why would you want to use those? Basically, those cover the mid value needed for your illustration. So if you're drawing a face and you're letting the paper show through for the mid value range of um, cheeks, part of jaw, maybe forehead, then all you have to draw in with your ink is the darker portions, the eyes, the eyebrows, the shading around the nose, um, it, the lip deviations, those types of things. And thus it saves you product. It's also uh, sort of a technique. It's a artistic style. Um, if you want to go further, you could use then white ink for highlights, you know, tip of nose, um, the fullness of a lip, part of the eye highlight where the light shines. And it just allows for a different level of creative ideas. Now you don't have to use mid-range value colors. You could use things like Astro Brights from Amazon. There are a bunch of neon options. Again, understanding color value and what looks good with neons is really really helpful when using paper like that so it's a bit more intermediate when you go to draw and illustrate but it's a ton of fun 
um, I want to talk about some more unique surfaces. And with some of these examples, I'll have pictures to throw up. Um, some I won't. I'll try to give as many tips as I can um, to try and make using these as successful for you as possible. So the first tip I want to talk about is canvas. Because, yep, you can pen and ink on canvas if you gesso it first. My tip for this would just be make sure the gesso is completely bone dry before beginning. And since canvas is a more expensive surface, make sure you're using a pen that is light, fast, and archival. Um, some pens state that on the body of the pen. S some others you have to go to the website. And some you might have to do independent light fast testing with small sample canvases. So when you look at things like Micron, it says that the ink is archival. Now I happen to know that the black ink is light fast. The red Micron is not. So again, you're going to want to do some independent testing with these, especially if this is something that you're selling, if it's a commission, if it's going up in a gallery or museum. That's very, very specific, but you can ink on canvas. It's a ton of fun. The next surface I want to talk about is ceramics, and this is a lot of fun. You will want sort of a special pen that states under glaze or oxide on the pen. And this one sort of toes the line on pen and ink, fine liner. But this is an option if you have access to ceramics, to a pottery studio, to things like that, if you want to create on porcelain items you already have at home or ceramic items you already own. There are pens for that. The next surface is cloth. Now for cloth, you're gonna wanna use oil-based inks. Now this is a regular Sharpie. It is a ultra fine tip. But this one says oil-based at the top. So Sharpie does make an oil-based marker. They make um, other pens as well that we will get into later. But you're gonna want to use ones that are either oil-based or they say permanent on fabric. So there are fabric markers. Uh, craft stores sell both of these, at least they do locally where I live and I live in a smaller city. Uh, my best piece of advice would make sure that the fabric you are drawing on is nice and taut and pulled tight and that the fabric has a smooth surface. And if it is a super fuzzy fabric or it has sequins or glitter elements, it is going to be a lot harder to draw on, especially if you want really fine tip detail. Allow for time when drawing on fabric. Set yourself up for success. You know, go slow, don't get frustrated. You can pull it tight. You can make sort of a shirt board out of cardboard underneath. Um, just be wary when you're doing that with fabric. And, you know, some print and cotton is a colored substrate. So if you want to draw already over a printed item, then you're doing colored substrates anyways, which is awesome. Um, the next one I want to talk about is wood as it pertains to like furniture and things like this. Um, this is another one where it kind of blurs the line. Again, oil-based pens can work, um, as well as things like Posca. These are a paint pen. I have at least one. Ah, here's the other one. I have a couple in metallics because I was trying them out. But these are a great pen for doing on wood. Um, this is a surface you're going to want to do a lot of pre-prep for. So you're going to want to clean it, dry it, sand it. Um, one of the finer grits for sanding, like 120 grit, works real great for that. Uh, and then maybe a primer for the foundation layer. And when you're done, you're going to want some sort of sealant. So be cognizant of that, especially if it is a piece of wood that gets handled a lot, touched a lot with people's hands and oils. You're going to want to form a sealant on top of that. The next surface I want to talk about is glass. Uh, so there are specific craft pens. I own a couple. These are by Craft Mart. These are a couple different um, tips. I can show you those. One of these is absolutely dead. So that's the bullet one, and that one has ink in it, and that's fantastic. This is the fine-tipped one. Oh, gosh. 
and you can see that one's completely out of ink but I wanted to show you that they made a couple different nibs and tips and these were at our local craft store and it says right on there that they write on glass um, if you're interested in these pens specifically it says that they write on wood metal glass porcelain plastic ceramic and more but when you are illustrating on glass, glass um, these special craft pens work. Um, Posca can work. Oil-based Sharpies are more permanent and paint markers. So anything that says permanent on the pen would work really, really well for glass. The next one I want to talk about is leaves, like botanicals, things you find. Um, this is a fun one for abstracts and hand lettering. Um, unless the plant belongs to me, I only choose fallen undamaged leaves. And I prefer mine not to be completely dried out. I have had a lot of trouble over the years with breakage and being too brittle once they're super dry. So I make sure that they're kind of fresh. And a wide variety of pens work on this surface. So... My recommendation is always get more leaves than you think you need for samples and trying different pens and experimenting because gel pens, paint pens, Sharpies, some ballpoint pens really work. It just depends on the leaf. So I've had a lot of fun with magnolia leaves and elephant ears, things that are huge surface areas. The next surface I wanna talk about is metals. So for drawing and illustrating on metal objects, permanent markers, um, paint markers, oil-based pens. I haven't experimented too much on the surface, but I imagine if you were drawing something uh, for an outside, getting a weather resistant ink or a sealant would be the most helpful in preserving this. Um, I will throw up a picture of a weather outdoor pen. I don't know the name of it offhand, but I know there is one, so I'll put it in a picture. Um, another fun surface to experiment with is papyrus and parchment and both paper type surfaces um, they're not smooth so that's why I kind of clump them together but because there's a ton of texture specifically with papyrus as this is made from a reed plant I would recommend going slow and having an extra practice sheet that way you get used to sort of the texture when you're drawing and creating. And a lot of different pens work on papyrus and parchment. Just experiment with what you have. Don't rush out and buy a hundred things first. Um, you're like, where do you get papyrus? I got ours from a home school store when we were doing an ancient Egypt thing and it was a ton of fun. So paint pens would look really, really good and vibrant. Poscas would look really, really great. But really, any fine liner, if you want to get really detailed, just know you're going to be drawing over lots of bumps and things. So, the next one, seashells. And this is one that is a personal favorite of mine. I've tried a wide variety and of pen and inks. And you basically have two options when it comes to creating. The first one is, you can just use any fine liner you have. Microns work. Um, Copic multi-liners work. Anything you have that can write on a very smooth surface, both work great. The only caveat to this is excessive handling of the seashell and what you've drawn will lift the color over time. You can literally like rub it off if you press really, really hard. So you're gonna want some sort of sealant or a Mod Podge would work. Um, the second method is just to do an oil-based ink that's permanent on the seashell and then you don't have to worry about um, sealing. The only caveat with this is some of these have really big nibs and when it comes to wanting really tiny details you may prefer a fine liner anyway. It just depends on how small you're illustrating and what kind of details you want. So that's my best piece of advice for seashells. And let's see, oh, stone and rocks. So I've had some luck with fine liners on the surface, but it's very similar to seashells. So if you don't wanna to have to seal it, 
oil-based permanent markers, paint pens are the way to go for rocks. And I think a lot of people um, do acrylic paint these days anyway, so doing a paint pen isn't really a far stretch. Toys, plastic, basically plastic as a surface. This one really requires um, some prep for this one too for success. So you're gonna wanna clean it off, dry it, sand it. Again, 120 grit is a really nice one. Um, it's a very fine grit. You're gonna wanna make sure it's a completely flat surface and then make sure it's completely dry when you go to draw on plastic. You don't want any moisture on your plastic. Permanent markers are the best for the surface, but you want to avoid oil-based pens. So you wouldn't wanna use an oil-based pen on plastic because it would take forever to dry. It just does. Oil on plastic, it's, oh, it takes too long. So uh, Sharpie makes an extreme permanent marker. <laughs> I'll throw up a photo. Uh, this is a great one and it's perfect and it's fade resistant and it lasts. So there's quite a few that work really, really well on plastic. Just make sure that they say permanent and that they don't have oil in them. Last but never least, walls. <laughs> and that's a fun surface to illustrate on. So yeah, paint pens, mural pens, they do make specific mural pens in case you're wondering. Um, acrylic pens work really, really well with this surface. Um, they might not be scrub durable. So if you are drawing and illustrating with like a Sharpie or something on your wall, but it's a high traffic area where folks come by and they they touch it for any reason for support or whatever they're doing. Maybe it's like a gym room and people work out and stuff. You're gonna want to do a sealant so it can be scrubbable, so you can clean fingerprints and things off. Uh, Rust-Oleum makes a clear spray on bullseye shellac that's pretty effective. Um, I'll link as many articles as I can about all these different types of surfaces in the description box below. In case you want to do further research, see more pens and ideas and really deep dive into one of these. But these are what I would consider intermediate surfaces. The next art supply I want to talk about that I consider intermediate are just a couple different pens that you may or may not know about or know what they are capable of. Um, I would say that a pen with more parts that isn't considered disposable is more intermediate compared to my beginning video where all I discussed were disposable pens that were just one time. Once you use the ink up, you toss the pen away. So the first one here is the Copic Multiliner SP. This is a pigment-based, waterproof, bleed-proof, acid-free archival pen. It has refillable ink and a replaceable tips. It retails for 10 and a half US dollars at jetpens.com. I'm not sponsored by anybody. I just like their pen selection. Um, I'll link videos showing how to do this from other creators. Let me say um, I have the 0.03, but this comes in a wide variety of sizes. All the inks are black. This is a very new pen for me. It's three months old. So I know that you pull, gosh, and I may need a coin. Oh, no, oh, I got it. Okay, so this is the cartridge that's inside the pen. Let's see if I can take this. And here is the tip, okay? And I just pulled. So these are replacement parts. It's a metal body pen, thus giving you longer usage for the pen. and you can keep using the body and keep going. This is great if you want to avoid plastic waste. If you are really, really into using pen and ink and you want something that lasts a little bit longer and has more parts, this is a great starter pen for that. The next pen I want to talk about is one I do not own because I don't have all the things, but it is, there's two different names because there's two different types. One's the Repedio Graph and one's the Repedio Sketch. And these are both by Koenor. And this is a fun pen because you can move it all directions as you draw, just like you're handling a pencil. So this pen is, it's stainless steel nib and it comes with replacements of those. It has refillable inks. It comes in different line weights and there's different color coded systems. So you can see those line weights from a distance. 
Um, it retails for 25 US dollars from Jet Pens, and that includes the extra ink that comes with it. Um, the Repedio Graphs, that's for the Repedio Sketch. The Repedio Graph Pens are 25 US dollars with the ink cartridges, and the replacement tips range in price from $19 to $30 US dollars. So there is a little bit of price difference depending on the size that you need. And the first pen I talked about, that one was from Japan. The Repediograph is made in the US. The last one's made in Germany. And this is the Rotoring Isograph pen. So this is a wear resistant tip that can be replaced if it is damaged. So you don't really wreck the tip yourself. I mean, if you drop it or it gets smashed, then you're gonna wanna replace it. But the pen retails, ooh, the tip retails for about 25 to 29 US dollars at Jet Pens. It uses bottle ink. So you can dilute the ink for different values and you can get some really interesting grays. The ink flow is achieved by gravity. The pen itself sells for 32 US dollars and the ink is not included. And again, there's different color tips that denote the size, so you can see that from a distance, uh, which one you need to grab based on the little color ring that's showing. Uh, these are a lot of fun. You can really, really experiment. I would stay away from Sumi inks, uh, things that have like little bits of soot and stuff. You don't want to risk gumming things up. So these would be the pens that I would consider intermediate just because they have so many moving parts and things can be replaceable and interchanged. I wanna do just a little quick bit on history and I'm just gonna throw some fun dates out of at you for some of the products that I've been talking about. Just because I just find history interesting, the history of art supplies interesting. I know it's not for everyone and you can skip it if it's not interesting to you, but I wasn't sure if you realized how new or how old some of these products are. And again, age is kind of relative to where you're at in your life. But Sharpie was launched in 1964 by the Sanford Inc. Company. Posca pens were created in 1983 by Uni Mitsubishi Pencil. Uh, let's see what else I have written down. Um, the first Repediograph was created in 1953. The Isograph Technical Pen, first launched in 1976 by Rotoring. And these are just some fun dates to throw at you um, for context. <laughs> there won't be, you don't have to worry, there won't be a quiz at the end of this video. I just wanted to like let you know how new or how old some of these pens are. Like I was three years old when these were invented and I find that absolutely fascinating. All right, so for the demo portion, I wanted to show you a couple different substrate. Um, colors that can be illustrated on. Again, these are the Astro Brights. I'll link this in the description box. And sort of here is a tiny color wheel. Having a cursory knowledge of color on the color wheel, where things fall, what, look, what looks good, sort of analogous colors that are next to this color on the color wheel versus complementary and understanding those differences can really help when putting together an illustration. So for hot pink, <laughs> this is actually a hot pink ink in a purple body. Uh, the hot pink body dyed. These are just Pilot G2s in the 07. Here's a burgundy, here's a red. These are very analogous colors to hot pink. So I know that I'm not too far off the mark. Again, I could just illustrate in black ink and draw whatever it is I'm going to draw. And that's absolutely fine. But if I want to up my drawing ability and understand certain concepts that lean more towards intermediate, then knowing what colors look like on hot pink and knowing that those aren't going to be too far off the mark, that they're going to blend well, they're gonna look really good. So the burgundy would make a great shadow color. The hot pink would make a fun mid-range color and then letting the page shine through either as the highlight or the middle tone for drawing and illustration. So if I'm drawing, this is gonna be real messy, a person's face and I'm doing, you know, I'm doing the eyes here. Like how quick can you draw a person? 
and understand here's sort of the nose and here's lips we need a little bit better chin going on we have jaw we have ear understanding inner ear and then the hair that comes down maybe it goes down the nape maybe there's like a neck situation again this is just a really quick doodle to understand that all this portion right here could be in shadow thus part of the neck is in shadow and then letting the color of the paper shine through so for eyebrows say they have you know a little bit of fun eyeshadow but really there wouldn't be too many detail lines here because this the light is shining this way is coming from this direction so you would let this portion of the page shine through and that is the middle value that is the tone of the illustration so for a color like <laughs> really obnoxious lime green you could use the lime green pen you could use dark green again all these are analogous green and blue are next to each other on the color wheel so it takes a lot of the guesswork out this is a pilot juice uh, and turquoise so this one is just a little bit different but I happen to have a lot of colors in pilot pens and they're easy to grab so drawing a picture of someone's face and understanding like the eyes are in the middle right when you cut the face in half maybe they're looking they're looking away they don't really want to know what they look like on my illustration and i don't really blame them at this point that's some sort of lip situation here and maybe they have like a sweeping sweeping bang of some sort that comes through and shines again these are sort of short-haired individuals but understanding that you need to have a shadow you need to have a light you need to have the mid-range color come through and how you choose to do that, what you let shine through, is what really makes colored substrates a lot of fun to work with and experiment with and try. Maybe this just isn't for you. Maybe you really like the contrast of white paper, black ink, or vice versa. And that is something that you lean into for your pictures. But this is just one thing I wanted to show you and demo for you. Again, this would be nice color. All these colors work really well. Having a spare page that you can swatch on to see what you like and don't like on the page can be really, really helpful. So always have a little bit extra. Have more than you need and then you can save it. Make notes, write down your swatches, the inks you used, what you like, what you prefer. If you draw something you really, really like, have a second sheet with it that explains how you did it, what you used, how long it took, you know, for realism's sake. The next surface I want to talk about is seashells. So I'm going to try and find some pens I have that might just work. So here is a Copic Multiliner. Uh, this one is either, that's brown. And then here is an 05 Micron in sepia, which is dark brown. And I really like it. And you can use these. Again, this shell has multiple types of surfaces and colors. This is sort of a calcium rich surface. But here is the micron. As you can see, it works. And it's shiny. You're going to want to let it dry. You're not going to want to smear anything. Here is the multi liner. The nib on this one's a little wonky. I do get heavy handed when I'm excited. But again, once these dry, which, you know, 
they look pretty dry to me. It's within like a minute they dry on the surface. I can then lift it. As you can see, I can smear these. Even if I let them dry overnight for like 24 hours, you can still smear the ink. So having like a Mod Podge sealer or something really, really works. But this is a fun, if you live by the beach or you're going on a trip, this could be a really fun memento. You know, you could date it, you can write where you got it from, you can draw a picture of a seabird. I've done lots of gifts with larger shells as trinket dishes. And they're just a ton of fun to work with. So here is the oil-based Sharpie. This is the bullet nib. This is the pink. It looks great. Let's do a Posca. Here is the gold. Here is their tiniest one. It's called the pin type. It's 0.7. I always get smaller nibs than I need as small as I can get just in case I want to add details later. Can you see that? There's the gold right there. And it's really, because it's a paint pen, it's wet. You're going to want to wait a few minutes to let that dry fully. But all these work great. Again, this is a similar surface to like eggshells are also a calcium rich surface. So if you like drawing on your eggs for Easter or holidays or for fun, that is something you can do. Basically, if you can dream it up, you can draw on it. If you wanna draw on your electronics, you know, your cell phone, your iPad, your laptop, whatever, whatever you wanna draw on. If you wanna go after your sketchbooks, like the covers of some of the sketchbooks that are smooth. Again, I would recommend more oil-based pens. They're permanent. Sharpies, the extreme, are permanent. I have had inks lift, so just be cognizant of that. Maybe try a little bit in the back corner of a sketchbook before you try drawing on it. And then these, these are fine. So, and again, I have oils on my fingers naturally, plus I moisturize because I draw all day every day. So, and those are permanent and don't need to be sealed. So, it's a fun demo. All right, let's talk techniques. I'm gonna be using the Copic Multiliner SP in point three. It is a finer tip pen. Let's get started. So, some of the techniques I recommend for advancing your illustration skills when it comes to fine liners, pen and inks, is having sort of a page of patterns of textures and having that somewhere as a resource, maybe in a permanent sketchbook or something that you put in like a plastic sleeve that you can pull out, but understanding all the different ways and types of textures you can create and knowing the differences between those and having those as reference when you go to create an illustration and you want a different value range because you can cross hatch many different ways. You can do it from angles, you can have it really wide, you can have it really loose, you can have it breaking up like it's falling apart, you're cross hatching, and all of that creates different looks. You could change the size of your lines and they can be shaped like squiggles. Having a page that allows you to understand Tons of different concepts. Again, I apologize. All my neighbors are doing yard work and I really want to get this video out to you. So if you could bear with the extra noise, I'd really appreciate it. Following lines of contours, practicing this. Contours can be a very difficult subject or matter to try and create and recreate. Think topographical map, but having that as a reference and knowing that you can have the value ranges from light to dark when it comes to scribbling, when it comes to scumbling, which is just tons of concentric circles. Um, understanding value range with overlap and then how many layers you overlap. 
So this is one layer, this is three layers. This is two layers. And knowing what that looks like when you go to create, if you want to start with a solid value and then have that break apart in different ways via scribble, via stipple and dot, and having this be a reference sheet that you have on hand. And maybe it's just little lines that get further and further apart and there's less of them that overlap and understanding all the different ways you can draw and create with all the lines that you have, okay? It doesn't have to be fancy, it doesn't have to be formulaic, nothing has to be uniform here. This isn't, this is just for you and your references. So if you're trying to figure out design and pattern and I'm just doing sort of interlocking scallop shapes you have this as a reference for if you later decide, oh, I want to try mermaid, which is a drawing challenge the month of May to create a mermaid every day, and you want a pattern for the tail, if you're doing the challenge in pen and ink versus just single scallop, or you want to take on drawing snakes and you want unique patterning or maybe she's drawing corn on the cob, or maybe I'm doing a braid of hair. Okay. All these different things put together help strengthen your illustration skill because you can see what these look like and the different imagery that they create versus if drawing a ball with this technique is gonna look way different than this technique. And which one do you like better? Which one works better? Maybe you're doing a ovals and later this would be a fun rock wall or again, an overlapping scale for dragons and maybe all the lines and the shadowing comes from the left. And then this is a pattern reference that you can pull from and use. And it can be basically anything you think of can be part of this reference and work for what you're doing and figuring out how you like that. Maybe you like things really, really uniform and concise. Maybe you like them really slapdash, like how, like how I do that. But having all this is a broadened view of all the different techniques your pen and ink can create. Again, I haven't done all of them. I'll throw up some pictures of some extra ones, but having this as a reference is really, really helpful for um, especially if you get something like artist block or some sort of rut and you just want to sort of, you wanna draw, you don't know what to draw, grabbing one of these patterns and just doing abstract shapes can really loosen up your thoughts and your mind and kind of get you out of that funk. So understanding difficult textures and surfaces, this one lends itself to that. Understanding like wood grain, like if you're drawing a plank of wood and wood has knots and wood has contours and wood has broken lines. And again, it depends on the wood. Maybe you want to draw something local. Maybe you're drawing a piece of furniture that you want to design. Understanding what that looks like. Like wood is not symmetric. Understanding wood grain. Maybe some of the lines are thicker and darker and more pronounced. And some of the lines are much thinner. Maybe a beetle has bored a hole through, you know, one of the lines. Understanding complex textures, drawing fur, drawing like fabrics and folds of sheets, of outfits, understanding Different things and concepts like this can be really, really helpful to up the level of your drawing. So take notes in this section, write down things you want to work on that are within 
your interest level. If your interest level is botanicals and you really want to go um, super micro and understand that like on a lot of stems, they're super fuzzy. Like it depends on the flower, but a lot of leaves and things have some fuzz and some have jagged points and edges. And understanding that when you go to create your flower could be really, really helpful. I don't know what flower this is. I've invented it, but knowing all the textures that you need for the things you want to create. So obviously pets have fur and there are a couple breeds that have like hair where it's really soft. Getting down into the nitty gritty fine details like that is definitely an intermediate technical skill. Learning how to cover large areas with consistent tone, with consistent value. So if you are working a five, a four, and you want everything to be the exact same value, learning how to do that with pen and ink so everything is identical along the whole space is intermediate. Having it all be one shade, one color, one value. That's an intermediate skill, especially when covering larger areas. It's much more difficult to do. It's a lot of things folks need to practice on, especially if your nib is really tiny, you're gonna wanna allocate time. So when you go to level up your illustrations, allow for twice the amount of time, pick harder subject matter, Maybe start adding color and delving into the world of color theory for complexity. There are a lot of fine liners that come in a variety of colors. Maybe adding one in the very beginning, like you're doing black ink and you just decide to add a little bit of spot green. And then you choose what items you wanna highlight green, which goes into the next one, focal point. Um, I'll, I can throw up a landscape picture, but you can imagine one from like a magazine. Here is just a little viewfinder. I cut this from a piece of thick paper. And moving this around, there's two ways to find focal point. You can literally have something in print and move it around till you figure out what's the most important thing you want to highlight. If you're looking at a row of buildings, pick the building you want to draw. Have that be the main one in the center. That is the one you focus on. That is the focal point. That is where the artist's eye goes and understanding that. The next way, and I don't want to flash at all my stuff, would be photographs. So taking a bunch of photographs, and that's really easy to do on your phone, and you can turn the filters to black and white. Um, this is our dog. She is laying in the lawn, but understanding where she is as it pertains to the grid. So if I want to move her around and I want her to be the central focal point, I will put her face in the center. Understanding focal point. She is off center. Is that how I want her to be in the photograph? She is to the top. Is that visually interesting? Is that something I want to do in my illustration? Do I want to have more grass than, than the main subject matter? Um, a photo where that kind of works would be something like this. Can you even see that? It's just a lot of gray and there's just a branch. Things like that are really, really fun for trying to figure out, take, take 20 pictures of your subject matter and figure out how to center it, what you want centered, what you want your focal point to be. This is very intermediate stuff. It doesn't have to be pets. It doesn't have to be buildings. It could be, you know, the plant, the leaf. Um, let's see, I think I have some botanicals in here. I tend to take 800 photos for that reason. This is an anemone that is growing in our backyard wild. And I was trying to figure out do I want this front and center? Do I want it a little cropped? Do I want some of the other blossoms that haven't blossomed yet in this photograph? So focal point is something that you can mess with, with the viewfinder and with the camera on your phone.
and phones work great because you can delete them. Um, the other thing working on would be perspective and once you get focal point down and you start incorporating more elements, understanding perspective and levels can really be helpful. Again, go to your local library. It's a free resource. Get a library card. Get as many books as you can. Go online to find YouTube videos. Go on Pinterest. Go on as many free resources as you can take advantage of and really start pursuing the exact illustrations that you want to create. Look how the professionals are doing it. I have seen the gentleman that sticks a thumbtack in with a string and draws a line, and when he goes to draw everything, it's within the same perspective. So there are some tips and tricks floating around to be able to heighten this, and then understanding like foreground, middle ground, background, especially when you're doing large landscapes and things like this with pen and ink. And then my last tip would be critiques. And this can be a really, really difficult one to have your art sort of examined and sort of picked apart in different elements. There are ways to tactfully critique and be critiqued. Uh, I would check in with someone. I would ask them if they, free, if they have free time. I do a lot of things in trade. Hey, I'll make you a loaf of bread if you look at five of my illustrations and tell me what could be stronger. Just make sure who you're asking is someone who is at the level that you want to be at in the future. You know, someone that's kind of at the same level as you, it can be really subjective what they critique. But if there's someone that's really high up in the illustration game that you really admire their illustrations and you want some pointers and tips, like what could be stronger? What could I do differently? This didn't turn out the way I wanted it to. What's missing? Understanding some of those questions and understanding what you want to ask very specific questions when you go to get critiqued. Like how could this look more realistic or how could this look more fun? I want this more animation style. I want this more anime style. What could I do differently to tweak this, to make this look better, tighter, cleaner, more interesting, more the central focal point on a better perspective with a better, like how do I create this texture? Really start asking folks within the community, reach out. You can reach out to me. You can email me. You can show me a photo. I'm gentle. I'm kind. <laughs> I will tell you what I love and I will tell you what can be stronger. Okay. And that is sort of the best way to critique because what you want from somebody critiquing your work is encouragement and inspiration and motivation to keep going. If they're just sort of dumping on everything, that's not the critique for you and it's not the person and don't take it personally, find somebody else. But that is a really great way to enhance your illustrations and move up. Just dedicate a bit more time, figure out where you allocate your time. You can keep a time journal where you write down what you do every day and figure out where you can eke out more time. Maybe you're drawing at the wrong time of day when you're not, when you don't have enough and really allocate twice the amount of time if you can. If you're doing 10 minutes a day, try and do a full 30 minutes. And it will allow you the time to really relax into the finer details of fine liner pen and ink illustration to make it look more intermediate. Okay, I hope this helps. The last portion of the video today is going to be the tutorial. Now I have pulled a photo from Pixabay. It is a royalty free image site where you can download them for free. This is a photo of a Eurasian wren and this photo was taken by Grunder Coach. So thank you for letting us use this as a reference. I am in my Stology 365. This is going to be my illustration for the day. Because this paper is thin, I have a pencil board. This is just how I'm living my life. And I'm going to be using the Copic Multiliner SP in point three. So there are a multitude of different ways you can draw this wren. Now, you can draw this as hyper-realistic as you want to go without outlining. Uh, if it would make you more comfortable, you could take a pencil and pre-sketch. And then once you're done inking and you know the ink is dry, go back and erase the pencil marks that are showing. 
you can practice on a scrap piece of paper that you don't care about to reduce the amount of pressure, stress, and anxiety that maybe something like this gives you. Ink is very permanent. It's a permanent medium here, and this is intermediate. So we're gonna go in. Now here's the photo and I cropped it and I turned it black and white because I am doing black and white. I'm just doing black ink on white paper. And I'm going to try and start, I'm right-handed in case, <laughs> in case I haven't pointed that out, but I'm gonna try and start the top left and sort of kind of go around and come down. The thing with ink is if I am constantly going back and forth in different areas, one, I drag my hand through it and I get ink and I move wet ink around, especially on really smooth surfaces like this. Again, I'm wearing a smock because I drag my sleeves through everything to try and protect my clothes. But that's just how I go about when I start a tutorial. So I'm going to start with the beak and I'm going to come down the page. So here's the top of my page and the beak is not quite at the top of the bird, but it's towards the top of the paper. Now I'm coming over because I can then decide if I want an exaggerated body or if I want a little body and maybe another bird. I have that option. So I'm coming in, I am doing a loose triangle shape. I am coming in sketch style. I am doing horizontal lines. This can take as long as you want this to take. Now understanding that the bottom of the beak is darker, it is in shade. So you're gonna want thicker lines or lines closer together depending on what style you're using, dots closer together. There's a little dark dot here on the beak. It's darker on the bottom than the top, okay? And it kinda carves over and I'm just doing horizontal line hatching. Now there's a couple fun feathers that come up and I love that with birds. And we are gonna go up, we are gonna arc, and we are gonna arc again a little lower. Okay, and this is the top of the bird body. Okay, that's all we have. If you don't like what you have, you can do it again in pencil. Um, there are some pens that can be erased, uh, I believe through heat. And I'm just doing horizontal lines. Again, when it comes to intermediate illustration, you have to allocate for the time to draw intermediately. This is not something that can be done in five minutes. Uh, I can't do it in five minutes. So I'm gonna try and figure out where the eye is in relation to the tip of the beak and the top of the head. And I am going to draw almost a complete circle. It looks like it's flattened on top. Understanding shape and form. And I'm going to leave a huge eye shine. I really love eye shine, it makes eyes look realistic. So I'm going to try and mimic the shape that's inside. It looks like it wants to be kind of almost the letter T. If the bottom dropped out a little bit, that's how I'm identifying the eye shine. And then I'm just gonna color the rest in as black as possible. So you really know this is the eye and nothing else. But again, I can see on my page that this is really, really wet, so I need to make sure I don't put my, my hand through it. There is a little bit of a border around the eye, and it looks like it's broken up into little pieces, so I'm just drawing little dashes, little tiny dashes in my eye. And then when it comes to feathering and really close feathers, doing a wide variety of short lines that move all direction is a great way to do this. Now to make it look more realistic, you're gonna want some of them closer together to create darker lines, and you're gonna want some farther apart to make it look lighter. Now I'm gonna kind of denote a little bit the end of this beak here for me, for my illustration. You don't have to do that. I just really like how that looks. And I'm not having a background, so I'm also going to really lightly, with tiny marks that don't overlap, I'm gonna denote sort of the edge of the bird here where it's really light pale feathers. But know that the other ones underneath, next to it, are darker. So wider 
thicker lines, lines that overlap are a great way to denote things that are darker and just having some mid-range to connect the pale and the dark. This is all just lines. Welcome to Fine Liner with pen and ink. Yours feathers don't have to go the same direction. They can go in a lot of different directions. If you want to denote clumps, you're going to want to do your little lines in the form of shapes to create clumps. And you're gonna want those to be darker in value versus the little tiny hatches on the inside. And that'll show that the feather fur type that we're trying to create, all this texture of this bird is a little clumpy. Now you don't want anything too uniform. Nothing in life that is living is uniform. So if you start making your clumps all fit together in the same way, the same size, it's not gonna look right. You want your clumps, let me get my scratch page. You want essentially your clumps to be all weird and wonky. You don't want any of them to ever look the same. And that is how you keep birds with tufts of feathers and fur and things looking more realistic. And again, we're gonna step back when we're done with this and we're gonna go in and look, where can I add darker value? And a little bit more overlap to make portions look more realistic and more interesting. You don't want it all the same value. If everything is equal distant and equal color, this bird is not going to look as good as it could look. And we want this bird to look amazing since we're taking the time to draw it, right? And again, I'm just doing really quick lines in different directions and yours can go different directions. You can leave little gaps in the tufts if you want more highlight in your bird. So if you want your bird to be a little lighter in color, don't do as many lines, okay? And that could be a great way to sort of get a feel for this bird. We're gonna come down and we're gonna start to arch the belly a little bit. Um, less is more and you can always add more later. Again, pen and ink. I'm not using a pen that is erasable. I did not pre-sketch. I'm very comfortable with this subject matter and that really, really helps with confidence, with just, there are no mistakes with this. It's pen and ink. So even if you go right out of the bird shape, that's fine. It could be just a loose hair, a loose feather, a loose whatever. Now I'm getting wider apart and less close together as I get towards the neck area. And that is because it is a little bit lighter in color and we really want to make this re bird realistic. So when I come in and it looks like that some of the feathers on the bird's back are clumping. Again, we kind of want some things to line up, some things not to line up, some to be bigger, some to be smaller, um, some clump lines to be a little thicker than others. That's what makes this realistic for birds. They are not perfectly uniform. They're just not going to be. And then at some point, there is the world's most fun tail. And I have to figure out, when I go to draw it, I look at the top of the head and I want to try and recreate that angle to the tip to try to figure out how tall I want my tail to be. And everything's in relation to everything else when I'm looking at a reference. And this really arcs over gently and it looks like there's some other arcs and it comes down at that angle and starts to arc again. And as it reaches the bottom, there are some individual fun feathers that get smaller, okay? And we can, we can draw a line. I'm not opposed. I might go right off the page. Um, I'll be as careful as I can. So here's sort of the first chunk of feathers that doesn't overlap. I'm gonna go right to the edge with this illustration. Here's the second one. And then here would be the closed body. And again, I'm doing little tiny dot dashed lines that aren't connected that way if I don't like it, if I want to reshape it, I have it committed like a huge, solid, thick chunk line. 
Now we can go back at the end of this illustration and create thick chunk lines if you like to totally change this style and I can show you how to do that. So for the tails, it looks like, again, there are solid lines and we're gonna need those to be pretty dark in value to denote shadow and there's some striping. So with the stripes, we are going to, I'm just scribbling lines and I'm making sure that they're not uniform. They're kind of arching down. They're coming down at an angle towards the end here. And then I'm gonna fill the rest with vertical lines. And I can blend these in a little gentler if I want to. I can make them go down more by adding more value. And then you're gonna add more. So another solid, really dark value line. And you don't necessarily want these to line up with what you've had. Some can line up with the previous ones. Some can be closer together. Some can be farther apart. Again, nothing should be uniform. Okay, when drawing a bird. Here's another one. I'm gonna draw a really thick, solid line here. And again, I'm trying to do this from a weird angle at a distance, but if you can get closer to yours, you might be able to get more, a better realistic view of it. I'm making sure that those solid, solid lines for shade are solid. And then when I look at these little fun tail feathers, I see a shadow. I see a very dark shadow and I'm coming up and drawing out. And when you start at the bottom, it's thicker. And as you lift off, the line becomes thinner. And I wanna just denote that kind of shadow right there. That's why I turned this photograph black and white. I really want to see where the dark portions are and where some of the lighter portions are. And I am denoting the feathers darker. I'm highlighting that. This one has a fun little extra thing. These are just lighter lines compared to the bottom. I want the bottom to be darker, almost solid for that shadow, okay? And those are the tail feathers. Now, when we get into this wing, uh, it looks like it is horizontal. There are horizontal, we'll come back, we'll come back up and thin it out, but there's going to be horizontal lines here. And again, I apologize for my hand creating such a huge shadow. But you can see the horizontal lines in the photograph. This one has horizontal lines too. And I'm gonna denote some of those horizontal lines. I want you to see those, really, really see those before this one becomes, has some vertical ones. And this one has some that kind of shape like this. I want you to see that they're, they're varying what the lines look like together. Okay, this is just a rough outline of what that looks like. And then we're gonna come in and we are gonna scribble lines like weird zigzags across these, weird zigzags. You want the shadows, you want the highlights, you want the middle range. Now you can make your feathers come up higher. You can make them a little lower. There is no right or wrong with this. All birds look a little different. Um, obviously the males of the species and the birds are the more colorful ones and that is to attract the females. Again, I'm doing just squiggly lines. But in drawing photographs from reference of female birds, all those browns, because the females are a lot of brown, that can be really good for turning into black and white. So I want to denote that these are two different wings so I really want a dark line here. I want that shadow and I want to bring that shadow down a little bit with lines that start to get farther apart, okay? I want to denote that one wing is actually on top of the other wing. And I am just gonna fill in with lines that are horizontal and some more of these sort of chunked fur-like shapes as they break apart and get looser. And again, we can come back in and sort of change some of this up. There are some more 
pieces like that in here towards the center. And if you add more ink, they become a darker line. So they start to blend in, start to blending in these shapes together. And it creates a more natural flow. Again, I'm just doing quick little hatching. Hatching is probably the quickest way to do this, or we could be here for a year if we decided to stipple. If you're going to stipple, allow for three times the amount of time. So there are some vertical portions that are very dark. And I wanted to note that. And I want that blending in to the other portions. I want this bird to look natural, but I want to have all the elements as well. Now there is a very dark line here. That is the shadow of the wing. So we can carry that across, make that really dark if we want. Again, I'm going off my page. I did not pre-sketch. That is one of the caveats to not pre-sketching. But this portion is a little darker. I'm just following along with the lines of what I see in the bird. You may see other things at different areas. Again, I'm adding a lot of darker horizontal lines to kind of blend in with this. And this can be thinned out, like it can go from thicker to thinner, so it looks a little bit more natural. And then we can come back in with the really soft, just overlapping hatching in different directions, different angles. Now towards, as we start to curve under, this is the shadow of the bird. We're assuming the light source is coming down. So these could get closer together, more layers overlapping. Now there is a lake and we want the lake. So we're going to denote that line that initiates the crease and it just sort of lightly blends into the shape. Okay. And our dog says hi. Now we want to make sure that these little lines and I'm just are closer and darker and as we get towards the center of the bird they're less overlapping the little lines are farther apart and this denotes the shadow and the highlight of the bird okay and you can decide where the shadow is like if you want your shadow to be from my pen down or from my pen down or from here down a little darker in color Okay, and again, I am just doing really quick, fast lines. Your lines could be more uniform if that is what you feel comfortable with. Um, I am going for a slapdash here. If you want to move in to my YouTube channel, we could be here for a year. We really could. I can do an advanced where we look at every single individual, but right now I am just grabbing the darkest ones and making sure I denote those with more ink. Dark is more ink, light is less ink. Understanding shapes. There are some little scallop shapes within the feathers towards the underside. And then I'm just gonna lightly move my hatching around all over all of it. And in the illustration, depending on what level you download, if you want to have this as a reference, again, these are gonna get far apart and really light, you can really see the exact direction of some of the feathers. So if you want it to look more realistic, you can follow that along. I'm going to add a little bit darker under here to denote the shade of the wing. as it comes down. Now we need, our bird needs feet. Gotta do the feet. Okay. So when I look at the bird length of the foot, now 
here's where you could have fun. Stylistically, they could go to the bottom of the page and your wren could have really, really long feet. You can add a wood grain texture. Your wren has long wooden feet. You could add really, really short feet uh, in like a comic anime style, or you can keep with the realism. So I notice we have denoted this really dark line here, and this is for the foot to come out of. This foot comes out at an angle. And this one, it arches. There is an arch. There is no hard lines with this bird. Comes down and it comes down. So you could, in relation, measure the leg of the foot to the beak and the head to make sure of different types of proportion. And that's sort of how you can use a reference. So if you want your leg to be the right length, figure out how long it is in relation on the bird of the reference to the bird that you've drawn. And you can make sure that it's correct or you can use an exact ruler. It's all up to you. I eyeball it at this point. I apologize for that. Anyways, this one arcs back up and over. So these are just little arches. These are just little arches, okay? And this is gonna stop right here. It's gonna be open-ended. Now, we need to come out for this one, and this one comes out at an angle, and it also comes to a point, like a real, like a curved triangle. This one's gonna come straight down. It's gonna be longer than the triangle. We're gonna do a little arch, and then we're gonna do a little point here. This is the nail. And again, I apologize, there's lots of noise. So it looks like the arch curves from here, and then the last toe comes out like a triangle to a point. You can do the little arch, you can do the nail. This is the foot, okay? This is the outline. When you go back in and you start looking at what that looks like as it connects to the bird, it is very dark. It is very dark. It's almost entirely in shade. And as we come down, we are going to shade this line. We're going to leave the other one alone. That is the highlight. That is where the sun is touching the leg. We are going to curve down with the darkness. Okay. Now with texture, you can do little arched contour lines. Again, I'm not fully touching that. I want some highlight on these toes. These these little birdie feet are really unique. And I want to make sure that you get that uniqueness with the lines that I am drawing. And I am only drawing from one side because I really want some highlights. And I'm making sure that my lines are arched and there's value, there's a dark, there's a dark, there's a dark, there's a dark, okay? I really want you to see that within my illustration. Yours doesn't have to be quite so dark, but again, you're looking at my screen and I want you, I want you to see what I see. There's also shadow on this side as well of this toe. So understanding like claws and things, and we can do a little tiny bit of something for this bird to hold on to. The second leg, I am doing <clears throat> right about here. And it has a little, hmm, like you wanted to make a circle and then couldn't commit. And then you come down and again, it's not exactly perfectly vertical. And I'm gonna come wide and get a little bit narrower as I go. And I'm gonna look at the reference photo, do those ankles sort of line up, kind of, kind of. This one starts to have weird lines first and then gets wider again. And on this one, you can only see three. So that adds a little level of interest and intrigue. And I'm trying to see if there's any nails. These nails kind of line up in relation to this one. And again, they can get closer together, kind of a point here. And this one comes down and comes to a point. I don't know if the nail is arching back, but this, again, is closer to the top. It's gonna be darker in value. We want, we want lots and lots and lots of darkness over here. 
We want the dark value, okay? We want the shade. We want this to look more realistic. Again, if you want your bird feet to be long, you can make them really long. You can make them super short. It's as comical and fun as you want this to be. There is no right or wrong. It is illustration. Please have fun with this. And then I'm going to shade this side, the left side. And I really like some of these weird rings. They look almost like this bird has bracelets on. I know he doesn't. You know he doesn't. That's just how I'm describing it. And this is how I'm shading this one. And there is a lot of shade between the toes. And he's got some weird little ring things. He's going to be shaded from both sides. And it looks like this is just here. So, and if you want, you can add little dots. Little dots look great on skin. For some added texture, you could add dots within the feathers. Dots are a lot of fun to add, just for added interest. Now, you could decide, you could have a ruler, you don't need to have a ruler. Here's one of mine. Um, this is a piece of wood. So for my piece of wood, my piece of wood is not going to be a perfectly flat line. Wood is rough and wood is textured and it just is. So this is how I am adding the line here and maybe it goes up and it burls and I can then move on to wood texture or adding branches or things like this. Again, this is just the bird. I don't know how long the tutorial portion of this was, but you've seen in length. If you want to go back in, if you want some more darker portions, you can then do that because you went really light with the first layer. This would be technically adding like a second layer. If you're a watercolorist and you want to get into a little bit of pen and ink, going back in again is the second layer. Now, <clears throat> if you want to stylize your bird, you can. If you like your bird the way it is, by all means, leave it alone. Watch what I do. If you absolutely hate it, you don't have to do it to your bird. But what you can do to stylize a bird, gosh, I really want to turn my page, is you can create an outline that's thick and follows the shape of your bird. And what I love to do with outlines is I like it when they get thick and thin. So it varies in width as the outline goes around your bird. Okay, you can see where that's thinner, where it's thicker. Gosh, and I really, I can't tell you how badly I want to turn my page, but that is just not helpful. You can even have tufts of fur, like fur, come out of some of the feathers, come out of the outline. Now for here, it's gonna be very noticeable. And I can make the sides thin and the tops really thick for this outline. And that also adds sort of a additional interest when you go to outline things, have it change thickness and shape. And then this can come down. This is just a stylized idea. You can have it really be thick in the corner here, really soften up where it turns a corner. I apologize if some of that was off the screen. We're gonna get thin with it, and then we're gonna get thick with it. And thin with it. So you can add a really fun outline. 
depending on what you want your bird to look like if you like that style. Again, this is an option. What's best is what's preference to you and what you prefer your illustration looking like. I think this is a lot of fun. If you have done this on like a hot press watercolor paper and then want to use this as sort of a coloring page, you could then color over it. You could do colored pencil. There's so many things you can do. This is just one way to make it interesting. And then if you wanna leave this weird or you wanna put a piece of like washi tape or some other type of texture or paper or ephemera that makes up the branch or the stick, this could then be sort of a collage or mixed media with your fine liner abilities. So this is a Eurasian Wren. I really hope you enjoyed this. I hope you enjoy my longer format videos. I know there are a lot. I appreciate you so much for watching these and hanging out with me and drawing with me. I can't tell you how much it means to me that you guys really enjoy doing this with me. It just, it means the world. So I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you have an absolutely wonderful week and I'll talk to you later. Bye.